Welcome to this another edition of the Ancient Landmark. My name is Jared Jacobs, and I'm so thankful to be with you, and so glad we have this opportunity to once again open up God's Word and to study together. We encourage you, if you will, to get a Bible out and follow along with the things we're going to study as we spend time together in the Book of God, studying about the subject of modesty. Now, we have been studying about modesty, and we have uh, studied it from various angles concerning what God has said about the subject. Obviously, that's where we want to begin. And we have talked about uh, the difference between man's standards and God's standards and, and what God has described when it comes to modesty. We have noticed uh, in previous studies how that uh, there is a problem of underdressing, and that's a lot of times where people focus, at least in this country, on the, on the underdressing of things. But not only underdressing or the lack of clothing or the showing of the skin and all of this, but there's also the overdressing. And that happens, of course, whenever people uh, have things that's very gaudy. And and uh, in, in all of these things, we have a, a problem where the focus is, has been drawn to me. The focus has been drawn to my body. The focus has been drawn to, to, to me as a person. Whenever you look into the scriptures, you'll find again and again that God has said that when it comes to our lives, we need to have the focus on God. That we need to, to fo focus ourselves, but also have other people's focus on God. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, for example, when he talks about, Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Our standards have, have changed through the years, and that's uh, something that is, is, a, is, to state that is to state the obvious, is what I'm trying to say. Our standards have changed, and what once was considered, you know, taboo, and what was once considered out of bounds, and things you ought not do, and, and things you ought to stay away from, uh, has become more and more and more common, and it has become more and more and more acceptable. And I imagine just by doing a, a series of studies like this on modesty and, and on that kind of thing, that, that there's going to be folks going, I've never heard of this before. I've never uh, you know, had anyone discuss this or talk about this. Or, and I'm sure there's some folks that's mad about it. There's some folks that's, that is uh, discouraged by it. And they say, oh, I can't believe somebody would say something like that. And, and, you know, he's just an old fuddy-duddy. And he just is sticking in the mud. And he doesn't want to, you know, he doesn't want to get with the times. And doesn't want to get with the modern fashions and so on and so forth. And we're going to talk about some of that here in a moment. But nevertheless... To discuss this, really, it's, it's a problem that we have today. And the reason why it's a problem is because we have thrown God's standard away. And again, years ago, uh, people didn't dress like this, at least to the extent that we're seeing today. And it wasn't uh, there just for, for all to see and all of this. And uh, people had more of a sense of decency. People had more of a sense of modesty. In the book of First Timothy chapter 2, and verse 9 and 10, talking about dressing with shamefastness, sobriety, and so forth, uh, the ability to blush. And folks just aren't dressing like that anymore. They're not doing that kind of thing. It's not the uh, typical thing. And so we have studied about, about this from the scriptures and seen that what God has, has described and what God, the standard God has laid forth, begins in Genesis chapter 2 and Genesis chapter 3. Whenever we look to Adam and Eve and whenever they were first upon this earth, the Bible talks about them, how they were naked. And then Genesis chapter 3 talks about that after they had sinned, that they sewed fig leaves together and made for themselves uh, aprons. And the the Bible word there is hagora, which uh, translates loosely translates to the idea we would think of like uh, very short running shorts or things like this. Something that is around the groin area and just barely covers that area. Uh, both of them are topless. There's no uh, clothing or covering at all except just right there in the groin area and that's all. Well, whenever you continue to read in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 21, that after God had spoken to them and, and condemned them for their sin and condemned Satan for what he had done, he says he, God went and made coats of skins for them. And the word coat there is some versions we use the word tunic. And tunic is not the modern idea of a tunic like a you know baggy shirt. The idea of a tunic was something that went from the shoulders 
all the way down to the knees and, and sometimes even to the ankles. But at least from the shoulders all the way to the knees was this object, was this coat, tunic, was this article of clothing that God had fashioned and made for Adam and Eve. And so that was the standard, and it continued to be the standard all the way through the Bible. And we have read in, in other uh, programs and, and other broadcasts, we read from the book of Isaiah, and we read from other places about how uncovering the thighs and things like this, that that was showing nakedness. And not only this, of course, to uncover from the top. Uh, that was also showing nakedness. Now, again, we're talking about uh, from the standpoint of, of an uncovering, uh, from the standpoint of showing skin, how that was condemned. But then we go into the New Testament. We read about modesty there and saw that when modesty, whenever the you know they had the, the fine broided hair and, and the hair was braided with gold and silver and all of this, and the costly array, and that's talking about costly clothing and such, but it was things which, again, drew attention to yourself, and God called that immodesty as well. God called that immodesty, and so we need to be aware of that. We need to understand uh, what God was talking about and then make the applications to ourselves. Now, again, in our country, uh, yes, we have a problem with uh, gaudiness and such, but typically, our country has the problem with the undressing. Our country has the problem with the immodesty from that side. And so what I want us to do in this program is to talk about some of the excuses people make for dressing immodestly and see what God has to say about it. And, and again, our, our standards are, are flip-flopped in so many ways. I remember uh, seeing a little cartoon here not long ago, and a, and a fellow wrote, wrote a cartoon, just one of those one-panel cartoons, and you see this, this uh, well, it's, it's not a person, it's just the article of clothing. And the article of clothing is a, a woman's slip. And it was a, one of those, you know, longer type slips and went from, you know, and it had straps on the shoulders and went all the way down. It was a longer type slip. And next to this was a, was a picture and it had short shorts and, and had a little halter top and that kind of thing. And they're both there on that, on that, uh, panel and you see this little bubble this little voice bubble come out and the one with the slip says oh my the doorbell just rung and here I am in my underwear then over here the halter top and the little shorty short Daisy Dukes says uh, that's fine I'm dressed I'll get the door now you see the problem the little shorty shorts and the little halter top says they're going to go get the door because they're dressed. And here's this big long slip that, that, that covers and, and they're concerned about being in their underwear. That just shows us how flip-flopped our standards are. And I'm not saying you go answer the door in your underwear. But what I'm saying is uh, something that covered to that degree and you're worried about people seeing you in your underwear but then someone who has next to nothing covering them, and they're like, yeah, no problem, I'll get the door. That's how our standards have flip-flopped in this society. When you go to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verses 3 to 5, when you go to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, those are examples in the New Testament of the emphasis upon dressing in a way that is modest, dressing in a way that where we're covered, that is something that is talked about and that is something that is emphasized throughout the scriptures. And so I need to be one, if I'm, if I'm interested in doing what God says, then I need to be someone who is ready to dress in the way that God wants me to dress. And even as we talk about this, uh, sometimes people say, well, you know, you're, you're talking about dressing like the Puritans or you're talking about dressing like a pilgrim or you're, you know, whatever. No, you can dress in a modest way and still be fashionable still be, you know, a modern, a modern look. And sometimes people say, well, you know, you just don't understand. This is one of the excuses we'll give. One of the excuses that's offered is you don't understand. The fashion industry has, is really responsible for this problem. And the fashion industry, uh, you know, puts out whatever clothes for the season, whatever clothes at, you know, certain stores, whatever, and that's really the problem because I, there's nothing else out there. I've got to wear this because there's nothing else out there to wear. And I've got to buy so-and-so. And therefore, that's what I've got to wear. And I don't have a choice. 
Well, to that, I want to say, number one, that, that excuse, I want to say this. Who made it a law that says you can't alter clothing? I mean, really, who made it a law? I mean, people still sell sewing machines. And there's still folks called seamstresses that will go out and you can give them your clothes and you can tell them what you want the clothes to look like and they will alter them accordingly. That's what people do. Uh, you know, I know of folks who have bought, I know, uh, you know well, ladies in particular, but I mean, I know ladies that have bought different dresses and things and they might have bought it and they said, oh my, this is a plunging neckline. This really goes down and it shows a lot. And so what they did was they took a piece of lace, they took a piece of fabric, whatever, and, and sewed that across, and so uh, it made it fashionable. It's still a fashionable dress, it's still a fashionable outfit that had something that's covering their skin. It's something that would cover them and, and make them so that they would not be immodest. Um, sometimes it was because the dress was too short. And remember what we talked about. First of all, it's a matter of the heart. It's the inward man of the heart. You remember that? The inward man that's being shown, 1 Peter 3, 3 to 5. And from that then, you, you have folks that they might have something that's, that's too short because God had, had covered mankind from the shoulders all the way down to the knees. And so if they've done that, and this particular dress or outfit, whatever, doesn't do that. Sometimes they might try to layer things. And we've, we're familiar with layering and just layer it. Sometimes it, it takes uh, a couple of things just to, just to make it uh, so it's decent. We talked about uh, here in, in one of our other programs, we talked about the problem that, that tights are not pants. And there's folks making the mistake of thinking that you can put on a pair of yoga pants or tights, you can put on a pair of tights and just walk around in broad daylight as if that's okay. Listen, tights are not pants. And something that's showing every crease and, and, and line and crevice is, is not the thing to be doing. All right? That's immodest. And this is supposed to be the hidden man of the heart that's being shown. Well, used to, uh, whenever folks had something like that, they might have had a long um, shirt, a long sweater, whatever, and it covered, and it covered down to the knees. And those things, you know, that way everything was covered. It was just a layering thing. And you were modest in doing that. The problem was that as time has gone on, the, the shirts and the sweaters kept going up, 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 up. And so uh, more, of the, more of the leg and, and the groin area and all of that's being shown and on display. And that's where the problem is. Listen, our fashion industry can do whatever. But the fashion industry is not God. The fashion industry is not our standard. Our standard is what has God said? What has he told us to do? And, and like I said, we can be stylish. And anymore, if you'll uh, just pay attention, there are websites, there are different places you can go that even advertises as modest clothing that is stylish. Get it. And be a blessed person for doing what God says. Another excuse that comes up is that somebody says, well, you down preacher, now you need to understand. Everybody dresses this way. Everyone dresses like this. Everyone dresses immodest. Nobody notices. Nobody even notices anymore because that's what everybody does. Because this is the normal thing. And, and so you're getting after things that and really no one even notices now because we're all dressing about alike. Well, I guess that's why advertisers today use women, especially women, who are just barely clothed at all and put them in their ads because nobody notices that, right? Nobody notices this woman in a string bikini laying across the hood of a car. No one notices that, right? And, you know, for years, uh, Carl Jr., and he was uh, the, the hamburgers and all that, and that was scandalous ads and people's having a fit about this because of these women who were you know they were eating the hamburgers and all that but you know they were scandally clad they were very immodest and all of this and and so I so I suppose that's no one really noticed that they were just focused on that hamburger right that's why he did that because those poor girls they they were they needed a job right yeah, see, you know better than that. You know exactly why he picked those uh, kind of women and exactly why he did that. 
And it's interesting to me to note that in recent times, here in the last year, as of 2017 at least, Carl, uh, Carl, uh, he said he wasn't going to use those kind of women in his ads anymore. He was going to go another direction. He wasn't going to use those kind of women in his ads anymore. You know why? He said because people were focusing on the women and he wasn't selling hamburgers. So he figured out, you know what, if I want to sell hamburgers, I need to get hamburgers out in front of people's faces so they understand that I'm selling hamburgers and not uh, the scantily clad women uh, eating the hamburger. He said that's all people was focusing on. They weren't focusing on my hamburger, so I'm going to change my ads. See that? And, I mean, those types of, of testing has been done for years. There's an ad agency that did some, some experiments, and, and they gave people uh, pictures. One picture uh, had a product, and it had this immodest woman uh, in it. Then they had a product, and it was the product uh, in a, it was a mountain scene or some nature scene or just sitting there on the table, whatever. And after the experiment was done, they took a little survey. And the people who saw their product in a mountain scene or nature or just sitting on the table or whatever like that, they remembered the product. The people who saw just the immodestly dressed woman holding the product, they could just remember the woman. And so that's been going on for years. But again, somebody says, oh, but you know, everybody dressed immodestly and so on, no one ever notices. Well, if that's true... What about those places in the world where the population wears no clothes at all? See, there's places in the world where they know wear no clothes at all. Would you go for that? I mean, why not? If all the culture's doing it, you're just not going to wear any clothes at all? Think about it. Go back to Romans chapter 12 with me. In Romans chapter 12, the first two verses... Romans 12, 1 and 2, where Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Here in Romans 12 and verse 2, he says, Do not be conformed to this world, be transformed. What he's saying is, don't act like the world. And so people making the argument that says, well, everybody does it, and you know, no one knows it. Well, Fine, the world does those things, but if you're going to be a child of God and you're going to respect what God says and you're going to follow in the Lord's ways, then you're not going to be conformed to this world. You're going to be transformed. So in other words, I'm not going to dress or undress, as the case may be, like the world. I'm going to dress the way the Lord wants me to dress and be a blessed person as a result. Now that's what it's going to take. And so away with these excuses for immodesty, and let's get back to what God said, and let's get back to respecting what God has taught us. Let me pause for a moment and remind you, this program is brought to you by the Caneyville Church of Christ. The Caneyville Church of Christ meets together on the Lord's Day at 10 a.m. for Bible study, 10.45 for morning worship, and 5 in the afternoon for worship. We meet Wednesday night for a period of Bible study at 7. And you'd be our honored guest if you come and be with us. We would love to see you. We meet right across the road from the Sacramento Bank. Uh, there near the intersection of Highway 62 and Highway 79 in Caneyville in Grayson County. We would love to see you. Come be with us at any and every time that you can. Bring an open Bible. Bring an open mind as we study and learn from God's Word as we worship together and as we strive to serve God every day of our lives. If you have any questions at all, while you're there, you can feel free to ask. We would love to answer your questions. If you want to know why we do what we do, how we do it, whatever, ask your question. We would love to hear from you. Uh, if you're interested in a Bible study, you can call me, 589-4167, or text me, have, as the case may be. We can just sit down and have a Bible study together. And if you want to talk about this subject or any other Bible-related subject, please uh, do it. Please ask. We'd love to, to talk to you and love to set that up. If you'd like to have a Bible correspondence course, uh, we can send that to you. They're absolutely free, and you can join others that are a part of this Bible Correspondence course, and we'll send it to you. It's absolutely free, like I said. You don't even have to pay for a stamp. We'll send you a self-addressed stamped envelope to send the, 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 the courses back. And so it all, all it costs you is your time. Just to sit down with God's Word and study it, and you send it back to us, like I said. If you are interested, uh, also, you can go to our website, CaneyvilleChurchOfChrist.com. 
and it's available to you 24 hours a day. You can go to our Facebook page. Look us up, Caneyville Church of Christ on Facebook. And you can like us and follow us. And we strive to update uh, on the Facebook page and strive to update on our website just several times during the week. There's always new stuff, new videos, radios, new sermons, written material, things to read and study. And all. It's, we strive to update and keep that all going. And so if there's things there that you'd like and you can send us messages, you can talk to us, send us an instant message, whatever. That's all available for you, and so we'd love to hear from you. love to study with you on this subject or any other Bible-related subject. And like I said, if you want to call me, call me, 589-4167, or text me, and I'd love to hear from you. We're talking about the excuses people offer for dressing immodestly, and we've looked at a couple already, but what about this one? Somebody says, well, it's hot. You know, it's hot. That's the problem. And, you know... I mean, it is hot in the summertime, isn't it? It's hot in the summertime, but, uh, you know, dressing immodestly anymore in our climate-controlled environment of the United States, uh, you know, really, we can't use that as an excuse, and yet people keep dressing immodestly. I mean, think about it. You have a climate-controlled house, and you leave there and get in your climate-controlled car to go and drive to your climate-controlled work or climate-controlled school or climate-controlled shopping mall, grocery store, wherever. Then you hop back in that climate-controlled car, and then you come back to your climate-controlled house. And so there's, I mean, if you wanted to, there's very few places along the way that you don't have control over the temperature, or some human does. And so I said, well, I go outside, and I work outside, and I mow the yard, and all that, and then I get hot. Well, yes, uh, I agree with you. We get hot, don't we? But since when does heat justify my modesty? You know, I find it very interesting that in, in other areas of the world, the, the desert climates, uh, over in the Middle East and, and over in places like this and parts of Africa and other places that's closer to the equator and, and, and places like that, those folks don't take off clothes. They put more clothes on. They're dressed in robes. They're dressed in these various things. And it's the idea that, that they actually are staying cooler because they have clothing that, that actually wicks the sweat away and, and it, it's a reflection. Uh, it's light colored a lot of times and it actually reflects the sun away from them, not absorbing the sun's heat. It's that kind of thing. And, and they're wearing robes and, and other things. Now, you'd think that in a place where it's 100 degrees, 120 degrees, You'd have, a, you'd have a different situation. But have you ever observed that? Here it is, 100 degrees, 120 degrees, and those folks are putting clothes on. And so evidently it has something to do with the, with the attitude of the people then. Even if it's 100 degrees outside, God's Word still says what it does. God's Word still teaches me that my clothing is a reflection of a meek and quiet spirit that it must be that hidden man of the heart that is, that is shown, that is revealed. Still, and whether it's 100 degrees or, or negative 100, I mean, it just whatever the, the environment may be, has no reflection upon uh, how I act, how I dress, how I speak, as a, a person trying to serve God. I mean, if I'm really trying to serve God, then I'm going to follow His example, and I'm going to follow what He says in this area of life just as much as in worship, in salvation, in all the areas of life. And I'm not going to leave anything to chance. I'm not going to leave anything behind or justify something based upon how I feel on a certain particular day. See that? We see this again. Somebody says, well, you know, your problem is, preacher, uh, you just... I've got to be in people's business. <laughs> and, and you just, that's your problem. And what I do with my body is my own business. And you have no right to say anything because it's my body and I'll do with it what I please and how I please, when I please, and where I please. Okay? Well, what are we going to do with 1 Corinthians chapter 6? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, that tells us, in verse 19 to 20, that my body belongs to God. What are you going to do with that passage? That my body doesn't belong to me, my body belongs to God. 
I need to glorify God in my body and in my spirit, which are God's. That's what the verse says. You know, what if, what if your children use that kind of an excuse for immodesty or anything else? What if your children said that? I mean, parents, what if your daughter come up to you and, and told you, listen, this is my body and I'll do with it as I please, when I please, and where I please, and so I'm going to dress or I'm going to undress the way I want to and you can't say anything. Parents, do you want your daughter to attract the attention of strange boys, strange men? You want her to attract the attention of these people under the guise of saying, this is my body, I'll do with it as I please. Parents, do you want your son to do that and to attract the attention of strange girls and strange women under his reasoning that says, uh, you know, well, I'm going to do as I please. I'm going to dress as I please. This is my body and I'll do what I want. See? And yes, by the way, women lust. Men lust and women lust. They both lust. Uh, it's not that men lust and women don't lust. I don't know who got that started, but I'm, going to, I'm here to tell you, women lust too. And that's not my opinion about it. That's Genesis chapter 39 and verse 7 and verse 10. That's Proverbs chapter 7. Uh, that's, there's many places in the Bible talk about a woman lusting after a man. She can lust after a man, a man can lust after a woman. Now, are you going to, use, are you going to accept that kind of an excuse from your children? And say, this is my body, I'll do with it as I please. You say, I never accept that. All right, then why do you expect God to accept that kind of excuse from his children. Think about that. If God's my father and I'm his child, then why would, he, why would I expect him to accept my excuse? Well, it's my body and I'll do with it as I please. No, 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 no. God put us here for a purpose. He put us here to, for, our, for us to serve him. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14, the conclusion of the whole matter, is to fear God and keep his commandments. And while I'm here on this earth, my body belongs to him, and I need to uh, dress in a certain way. I need to conduct myself in a certain way. I need to live in a certain way. And all those things reflective of what's said in the Bible. Not man's opinion, not man's thoughts about it. What is said in God's Word. That's what needs to happen. So what you do with your body is not your business. It is God's business. Somebody says, well, I'm going to tell you what, if somebody lusts after me, that's their problem. That's not my problem, that's their problem. Well, in a sense, it is their problem. I do understand a little bit of that. But the Bible also talks about putting a stumbling block in front of somebody in the book of Matthew chapter 5. You put a stumbling block in front of somebody, how does that make you innocent now? See, if you go and you put a stumbling block before people by your immodesty, and then you're going to blame them and be mad at them because they looked? Or going to say, uh, you know, that was their lust. That's their problem. And so if you look and you lust, that's your problem, not mine. Well, like I said, I do know there's some people that would lust after somebody if they were wearing a gunny sack. But at the same time, whenever somebody is uh, dressing in a way that's immodest, why are you surprised when people act like that? Listen, don't dress in an immodest way. Don't do that. Fight against that. Keep from that. Matthew chapter 5, 14 to 16, talks about being the light of the world and, and to, to allow your light to shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Glorify God in these things. Can't glorify God when we're living in a way that's, that's the opposite of what God wants. I need to live in a way that God expects and wants me to live. These are just a few of the excuses people give, and I know we could talk about many more. But I hope these will help us as we're striving to live the way God wants us to live and to serve Him all the days of our life, that I need to make sure my clothing is modest. Again, not undressing and not overdressing, but in a modest way, covering my body, to cover it in a shamefastness, sobriety, the ability to blush, the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit reflective of, of a person who wants to serve God and who wants to live for God every day. And you do that kind of thing, my friend, and you're going to be blessed because of it. I know this is a hard lesson to hear, and I know these are hard things to, to hear whenever maybe we hadn't been taught it very much. But we need to get back to what the Bible says and follow what the Bible says every single day. I'm so thankful for this time. I'm so thankful for our study together. And I hope this has been helpful to you. Until next time, Lord willing, we bid you good day.